Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. All right, guys. Uh, in that short video I, I posted yesterday morning, uh, asking, uh, you know, post your favorite historical figures. I have this channel, Biogra not I have it. I, I know of this channel, Biographics. Amazing biographies, video biographies on uh, famous historical figures. And you guys put a bunch of great ones, but one really stuck out to me that I'm like, okay, I'm definitely reacting to that one because it very much interests me. And that's Horatio Nelson, Justin C., and then also uh, Grib68, both of you. Um, Admiral Nelson, a man that tried uh, to be perfect. Uh, wasn't for, it should give you a chance to learn a bit more of the oldest commission warship in the world, HMS Victory, launched in 1765, the same year as some Americans got upset about the Stamp Act. Well, it wasn't justified to be a little upset, okay? Uh, so I, I love this. I love British seamen ship. I'm a child. Um, just the 18th century, mainly 19th century British ships, kind of before metal gotten like steel or iron got majorly involved in, in the holes of ships, you know, mid 18th century British sailing ships doesn't um, ha just have to be warships, just uh, any any kind. I love seeing how all of these all these riggings and all these things that seem to have you need to have such a professionals to to work all of these things. I'm not sure what the average you know needed crew was to to just sail one of these big ships. Obviously, it would depend on the size of the ship, but I I just love how shipping has has seemed to transform over these centuries and millennia. And the Brits have just been amazing seamen um, in 19th, 18th centuries. 20, uh, even today, too. U.S., I think, has a leg up, though, finally. But I love that area of history. And so this is going to be Battle of Trafalgar, right? Oh, right. No, this is just about Horatio Nelson. Duh. Ah, Britain's most beloved sailor. If there's two things that I would love to do, it would just be in England. It would be probably visit this ship, or I'm not sure how much you're able to go on it, and visit visit a castle, a ship in a castle. I would love to do that. Um, I, I don't know where I'm going. My name's Connor, Rhode Island, New England, USA. I like to learn about things. Hit all the buttons. Originally to the video, top of the description, right below that, link to the Discord, right below that, link to my second channel. Mr. McJibbon, where I do more history-related stuff. If you go to the Discord and you are not verified, you won't get a role or whatever, don't worry. I'll check every 24 hours and, and uh, promote you if you do join and put stuff down in the recommendation channels. Uh, yeah, let's go. Go. Just before we get started, I do want to mention another channel that I host called Mega Projects. Mega Projects is a channel all about mankind's greatest achievements, where I take a deep look at incredible buildings, projects, structures, and more. Whether it's the world's most impressive sky, I saw other good names, the by the way. Uh, Audubon Bismarck, Chernobyl Captain the Great. I cover it all. Um, New videos come out a couple of times a week Napoleon on Mega Projects. First. So I think it could be for you. Please do go ahead uh, and subscribe. A lot of great figures. I'll check them out as well. Below and let's get or, into it. I'll put them in a poll on YouTube and like four of them and you guys can choose one. That's what I'll do. Did he, did he have a promo code? Um, Mega Projects, just any promo codes, just anything he's promoting, want to make sure I can push to my audience since I'm allowed to uh, react to these things. Go. Preemptive like. Being an island nation, you would figure that Great Britain would have its fair share of naval heroes. After all, the wooden walls of the Royal Navy protected the nation from invasion by various unfriendly continental neighbors for hundreds of years and then projected British strength across a globe-spanning empire that the sun never set on. But if you asked who the greatest of Britain's naval heroes are, most people would give you the same answer. The humble son of an Anglican priest, Horatio Nelson rose to the rank of Vice Admiral while confounding and taking apart the French and Spanish navies sent against him, becoming one of the most famous men in the world in the process. And and at the time, I believe, if you've ever seen the movie Master and Commander, great movie, um, guy from Gladiator, Russell Crowe is in it. Great movie. It's about chasing, uh, I believe, a fictional French ship. What's it called? It starts with an A. Uh, around, you know, chasing it around South America. And there's a scene where they're talking in the captain's cabin eating dinner and 
main character, Russell Crowe, is, is talking about how he talked to him once. And so, like, even at the day, like, he, he seemed to be a very much a living legend and uh, sort, of, sort of a... at the time. He did everything he could do to encourage that fame, relishing in his own success. But he was also genuinely beloved by the people who knew him well, and particularly the sailors who served under him. His style of leadership is cited today in business and military leadership courses as being highly effective. Nelson's death only added to his legend, killed with almost the last bullet in the greatest naval battle of the age, and one of the most famous in world history. Once again, the Royal Navy had prevailed, frustrating the invasion plans of Napoleon and keeping British soil safe. But the death of Nelson at Trafalgar touched off a wave of national mourning that made people question if it was all worth it. But before we tell you about his death, let us tell you about his fascinating and complicated life. Guys, I don't have coffee. Be right back. Okay. Horatio Nelson was born on September the 29th. Pay attention. If you're not ready to learn, you're in the wrong place. Get out. 1758 in Norfolk, England. His father, Edmund, was the parish priest of the small village of Burnham Thorpe. His mother, Catherine's brother, Maurice Suckling, was a captain in the Royal Navy, and young Horatio seemed destined for a naval career from the start. In 1771, aged only 12, Nelson became a midshipman, reporting to the ship HMS Reasonable, captained by his uncle, to be trained as a naval officer. In those days, it was common for teenage boys to serve on Navy ships. In the days before military academies, it was figured that the best teacher for would-be officers was first-hand experience. His early career was helped along by his uncle, who ensured that he was continually transferred to ships that were to see active service so that Nelson rapidly gained more experience than his peers and was thus promoted quicker. In 1777, he was promoted to lieutenant and was assigned to HMS Lowestoff, which was about to sail to Jamaica and to war. <laughs> The rebellion of the 13 colonies of America had quickly blossomed into a worldwide war, with the entry of France and Spain into the conflicts on the side of the Americans. The Caribbean, where ships from all four belligerents routinely sailed, was a hotbed of naval activity. Nelson spent the next two years taking prizes, capturing enemy ships, the value of which was awarded to the ship's crew as prize money, all the while being given more and more responsibility as his obvious talents became apparent. He was promoted to captain in 1779, and in early 1780, Nelson captured a Spanish-held fort on the San Juan River in Nicaragua, his first significant military achievement. His career was temporarily stalled when he was struck ill with malaria and was forced to return to Britain to recover. Nelson soon returned to active duty in command of the HMS Albemarle, which he commanded up and mm. down the American coast until the war ended in an American victory in 1783. After the war, Nelson was sent to the Caribbean to act as a sort of policeman, seizing any American ships that attempted to trade with British colonial islands, which was illegal under the Navigation Acts. It was during this time that he met Frances Fanny Nesbitt, a widow who lived on a plantation on the island of Nevis. Nelson was smitten, and her uncle off Wasn't there a thing, I don't think you just mentioned it, where British ships would, like, pull over, like a cop, I guess, American ships, and sometimes, and remember, you know, accents weren't very distinguishable back then, if at all, between if you're an American or a British person, I think. Um, and, and they would sometimes just like come and make, just force some of the the people on the American ship to then go and work on the British ship because they're, they're accusing them of being like British. Or, um, As, as British um, shipmen who, who fled, and so they were taking them back even though there wasn't much proof. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. Offered him a large dowry to marry her. It wasn't until after they were engaged that Nelson discovered the dowry was a fiction. The family wasn't worth anywhere near as much as they had claimed. To make matters worse, Fanny had hidden the fact that she was infertile, incapable of having children until after they were engaged. Breaking off the engagement would have been dishonorable for an English gentleman, so Nelson had no choice but to go ahead with the wedding in 1787. The deception had soured the romance, however, and Nelson and Fanny would become more and more estranged as time passed. In 
1788, Nelson was sent home to Britain, and for five years he languished on shore without a command. With no war to fight, there simply weren't enough ships to go round in the peacetime navy, and so Nelson was kept in reserve on half pay and had absolutely nothing to do but tend to his affairs at home while continually badgering anyone he knew for a command. He got his chance in late 1792 when the French Revolutionary government, eager to flex its might to its neighbors, annexed the Austrian Netherlands, modern-day Belgium, which had traditionally been kept as a buffer state. The move heightened tensions between Britain and France, and in preparation for war, the Royal Navy called back its reserve officers, including Nelson, in January 1793. Soon after, France declared war, and Nelson's ship sailed to Gibraltar in May as part of a fleet determined to establish British naval Trafalgar. supremacy in the Mediterranean. The flashpoint of the area was the French city of Toulon, which was held by French royalists but came under attack by the revolutionary Jacobins. The city appealed to the Royal Navy for help, but eventually a large Republican force occupied the hills around the city and began to bombard it into submission. The artillery officer in charge of the bombardment was a young man named Napoleon Bonaparte, and this was to be the start of his own military My success boy. story, though no one knew it at the time. Toulon fell in December, and seeking a naval base close to the French coast, the fleet commander ordered Nelson to blockade the French-controlled island of Corsica, followed by an invasion in February 1794. After the army proved reluctant to proceed, Nelson himself was put in command of the land forces and helped capture the city of Bastia. He played an important role in invasion in February 1794. After the army proved reluctant to proceed, Nelson himself was put in command of the land forces and helped capture the city of Bastia. He played an important role in ground operations operations for the remainder of the Corsican campaign, using cannons offloaded from naval ships to bombard enemy positions. On July the 12th, Nelson was wounded by debris from an artillery round that exploded near one of his batteries. The wound eventually cost him his sight in his right eye. After the capture of Corsica, Nelson spent the next three years engaged in operations in the Mediterranean until French victories in Italy, at the head of an army commanded by Napoleon, forced the Royal Navy to leave their base in Corsica and sail to Gibraltar in December 1796. Nelson was on the way to join them on February 1, 1797, when, quite by accident, he happened upon the Spanish fleet that had left Cartagena and was headed south to the port of Cadiz to eventually link up with their French allies. Nelson's ship, unseen in the fog, Marshal Salt. I know it's not. It's, it's later. Diz to eventually link up with their French allies. Nelson's ship, unseen in the fog, escaped to alert the fleet commander, Admiral John Jervis, of the Spanish movements. Jervis decided to give battle, and on Valentine's Day, the two fleets met off of Cape St. Vincent. It was here that Nelson first distinguished himself in the eyes of the British public. In command of the HMS Captain, he engaged three much larger Spanish ships and captured two of them by boarding them and engaging in vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. The prize money from these two captured ships made Nelson rich, and his heroism at Cape St. Vincent. I love the prestige, you know, just the ceremony of, of handing over the sword, even in, you know, gracefully in defeat. Obviously, you're at the whim of your people who defeated you, but still. Had made him famous. He was now Sir Horatio Nelson, having been made vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. The prize money from these two captured ships made Nelson rich, and his heroism at Cape St. Vincent had made him famous. He was now Sir Horatio Nelson, having been made Knight of the Bath, and soon after the battle, he was promoted to Rear Admiral. One of the first things Admiral Nelson did after his promotion- And I know I was wrong about Trafalgar earlier. They were going to Toulon, all right? One of the first things Admiral Nelson did after his promotion was to oversee a plan to capture the city of Santa Cruz de Tenerife in the Canary Islands, an important Spanish outpost and stopover point for the Spanish treasure fleets returning from the Americas. The plan called for a simultaneous bombardment and an amphibious landing. But after two aborted attempts to storm the beach on the night of July the 24th, 1797, Nelson decided to lead the troops ashore himself. The resulting battle was a disaster for the British. The Spanish defenders were well dug in, and they blasted the invading troops on the beach with cannon fire and musketry. No sooner had Nelson gone ashore than he was shot in the right arm and collapsed back into his boat. The musket ball had smashed his humorous bone into multiple pieces, and he was rowed back to his flagship to be attended to by the surgeon. Medicine at the time period was barely out of the Dark Ages. Germ theory was still decades away, and the most common way to prevent a wounded limb from getting gangrene and killing the victim 
was to amputate it. Most of Nelson's right arm was sliced off and thrown overboard. Most of the British force didn't fare much better. When they withdrew the next day, 250 had been killed and another 128 wounded. Nelson was despondent, both over the failure to capture Santa Cruz and by the loss of his arm. He wrote to the commanding admiral of the Mediterranean fleet that he intended to return home to England and retire, as, in his words, a left-handed admiral will never again be considered useful. Ooh, I love that painting. Nelson remained in England for several months recuperating, but in March 1798, he went to see- Sorry if the popsicle earlier was annoying. I just really felt like a popsicle. Nelson remained in England for several months recuperating, but in March 1798, he went to sea again, having been convinced that the Royal Navy had use for a one-armed admiral after all, and that retirement didn't really suit him anyway. He returned to the Mediterranean, where he was given a squadron of 15 ships and ordered to Toulon to intercept a French fleet that was on the move. In France, Napoleon Bonaparte had become the most important political and military figure in the country. His strategy for 1798 was to invade Egypt with a large army and navy and thus bring pressure to British-occupied India. See, this is the part in that giant, over the summer I did that giant Napoleonic uh, war series uh, from Epic History TV. I never learned about Napoleon in Egypt. Um, and I, I also didn't really learn about Trafalgar in that either, so I'm, I would like to eventually. This was in the hope that it would threaten her commercial interests and force Great Britain to abandon the war. Napoleon got away from Nelson after the British ships were blown off course by a storm, but the British soon pursued them across the Mediterranean to Alexandria. The French army had already won a series of victories against the ruling Mamluks, and the French fleet was anchored off the coast of Alexandria in a delta of the Nile River in a supposedly impregnable defensive position. But Nelson was unimpressed and moved immediately to attack. As dusk fell on August the 1st, the British ships fell upon the stationary French ships. The French admiral, de Broyes, had figured that the shoals on on the flanks of his battle line would prevent the British from getting onto his starboard. The shoals on the flanks of his battle line would prevent the British from getting onto his starboard right side and thus surrounding him. So all of his sailors were ordered to man the port left side cannons. But Nelson's lead ships found a gap in the shoals, and suddenly the French found themselves under attack from both sides. Darkness fell, but the scene was illuminated by the battle raging in the Nile Delta. Cannons belched out flames from all sides and started several fires, including one that engulfed the French flagship Lorient. This exploded when the flames reached the gunpowder magazine, killing Admiral de Bray's. Admiral Nelson was wounded for the third time in his career, a flesh wound that he quickly had bandaged, and then he returned to the oversee flesh. the battle. Overwhelmed by wow. the amount of British cannons brought to bear on them, the French ships began to surrender as dawn broke on August the 2nd. The battle was, for all intents and purposes, over. The French fleet was completely destroyed. Out of 17 ships that began the battle, four were burned and nine were captured. The French suffered 3,500 casualties to the British 900. The battle had oh. great strategic consequences for the war. It trapped Napoleon's army in Egypt, forcing the general to return to France without his troops. He never trusted the navy again, and this mistrust would weigh heavily in his future military decisions. Great Britain, meanwhile, had gained complete dominance of the seas around the conflict. I, A, A, what Horatio has got on a leash? Why these, the old... Flicked zone, an advantage they'd hold for the rest of the war. Emma Hamilton. Nelson's victory at the Battle of the Nile made him a national hero. Heads of state from all over Europe sent him accolades, and he reveled in the attention. For all his many virtues, Nelson was rather vain and a shameless self-promoter. For instance, when, shortly after word reached London of his victory, he was given the title Baron Nelson of the Nile, and Nelson was insulted that he was only given a mere baronry instead of a more prestigious title. Shortly after the Battle of the Nile... How did I not know he didn't have an arm at this point? That Nelson sailed to Naples to refit his squadron. He was fated by the Neapolitan royal court and was a guest of British ambassador Sir William Hamilton. Nelson had briefly met Sir William and his wife Emma in 1793, but he was a far different man now. He was scarred, he was blind in one eye, missing an arm, and internationally renowned. 
Emma Hamilton was 35 years younger than her husband and was considered one of the most beautiful and intelligent women of her day. During Nelson's stay in Naples, he and Emma fell deeply in love with each other and soon were carrying on an affair that the entire world seemed to know about. The strange part was that not only was it apparent that Sir William was aware of his wife's affair with Nelson, but he was surprisingly open-minded about it considering the time he lived in. The three lived together in Naples and when Hamilton was recalled home mm -hmm. to England, Nelson returned as well and the three, the three lived together? set up together at a house in Hamilton was recalled home to England, Nelson returned as well, and the three set up together at a house in London, much to the fury of Nelson's wife, Fanny. <laughs> what? Around Christmas 1800, Fanny gave her husband an ultimatum to choose Emma or her, and, well, Nelson chose his mistress. The two never lived together again. Copenhagen. Where's Trafalgar? On obviously, January 1st, 1801. Obviously, it's at his death, so will be at the end. On January the 1st, 1801, Nelson was promoted to Vice Admiral and was sent on a new assignment to the Baltic Sea. Denmark, tired of Britain blockading her ports to stop French trade, had allied itself with Prussia, Sweden, and Russia in order to break the blockade of the Royal Navy. Nelson was sent as part of a fleet to break up this League of Arms neutrality that threatened British naval supremacy in Europe. Nelson convinced his superior, Admiral Parker, to allow him to take a dozen ships of the line into Copenhagen Harbor and attack the Danish fleet before they had time to join up with the Swedish and Russian fleets. Nelson attacked on April... I feel like if there is any country or... any area in Europe or country that is more susceptible to a British invasion, it's Denmark, just because of all of the, the different islands and the ways that the ships can go and bombard where, where they need to. The second. The battle didn't start out well for the British. Three ships ran aground early in the battle, prompting Admiral Parker to signal- How beautiful that is. Like, look, the, I don't want it to, to, to get past just why I am so interested in ships and know so little about them is just look at these things. Look at all of the rigging and, and the and and the shape of, of the of the hull just all of these little things, the cannons where they are, all of the sails and, and and whatnot. All of that just had to have been added and improved upon over centuries and centuries and centuries not just of British, but of, you know, many different, you know, European powers shipping, and earlier before then, uh, not just European powers, but I, I just the product that it is now, it's just, it, I, I, it's beautiful, and I would love to learn what everything, how everything works, and, and how it came to be. Start out well for the British. Three ships ran aground early in the battle, prompting Admiral Parker to signal the retreat. But Nelson, who had a better grasp of the situation than Parker did, decided to continue the attack. In a bit of his trademark wit, he held up his telescope to his blind eye and said, I honestly can't see the signal. The battle soon turned in the favor of the British as they destroyed three Danish ships and captured what? the trade had a better grasp of the situation than Parker did, decided to continue the attack. In a bit of his trademark wit, he held up his telescope to his blind eye and said, I honestly can't see the signal. Can't see it. The battle soon turned in the favor of the British as they destroyed three Danish ships and captured and burned a dozen more. Nelson called for a truce, which the Danes accepted. The destruction of the Danish fleet, together with the sudden death of Tsar Peter I of Russia, marked the end of the League and Nelson returned home to receive more accolades. He was now Viscount Nelson of the Nile and considered the country's foremost naval hero. In October 1801, Great Britain and France signaled the Peace of Amiens, ending the war. Nelson spent the next two years in Britain, living with William and Emma Hamilton and touring the country with them. Emma had given birth to a daughter, Horatia, that everyone knew was Nelson's illegitimate daughter, and the unconventional family all lived together at a country estate in Surrey. Honestly, I find that as amazing. Just these people who are just so fine, like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and now we got a child. Oh, yeah, she's not mine, but yeah. It's crazy, mind-boggling, but it's awesome that they make it work here. Until Sir William died in April 1803. Huh? And lived together at a country estate in Surrey until Sir William died in April 1803. Oh, now it's a month later, just... war again broke out and Nelson was back at sea. Yeah. 
Nelson was appointed commander of the Mediterranean fleet and given the pride of the Royal Navy, HMS Victory, as his flagship. His orders were to blockade Toulon, where the French Navy I will stand on you one day. Under the command of Admiral Pierre Charles Villeneuve was at anchor. It was essential to keep the French ships from escaping the blockade and moving north to the English Channel where they could help Napoleon, now Emperor of the French, invade Great Britain. For two years, Nelson and Villeneuve played a cat and mouse game with each other, a series of back and forth maneuvers that saw Nelson at one point chase Villeneuve all the way across the Atlantic to the West Indies and then back again. In August 1805, Nelson returned briefly to England on leave. He was cheered everywhere he went, much to his delight. In September, word came the Allied French and Spanish fleets had combined together at the Spanish port of Cadiz. Nelson knew it was time to return to sea. He departed on board Victory on September the 14th after Buckle saying goodbye up. to his beloved Emma. Nelson arrived at Cadiz on September the 27th and spent most of the next month preparing for the battle he was sure was to come. Meanwhile, his French counterpart, Villeneuve, was feeling the heat for Napoleon. The emperor was angry that his admiral wouldn't engage the British fleet and break out of the blockade at Cadiz. He sent a replacement overland to Cadiz to take command of the fleet. Villeneuve, in an effort to stave off the humiliation of being relieved of command, decided to sail out before his replacement arrived. On October the 20th, the 33 ships of the Franco-Spanish fleet sailed out of Cadiz is and were spotted by British scout frigates who quickly moved to inform Nelson. On October the 21st, Nelson moved his 27 ships to engage the enemy off the coast of Cape Trafalgar. At 11.45, he prepared to engage. He ordered a signalman to signal the rest of the ships in the fleet, England expects that every man will do his duty. A great cheer went up throughout the British fleet. Nelson was truly beloved by the many commanders. In a time when naval officers were expected to be strict disciplinarians to the point of cruelty towards the common sailor, Nelson garnered respect with affection and kindness. Nelson's battle plan was simple. He meant to close with the Franco-Spanish fleet as quickly as possible, cut their battle line into three pieces, and engage the enemy in ship-to-ship -ship combat, which he was sure he would be victorious at due to the superior training of his gunnery crews. He split his force into two squadrons, one led by himself aboard Victory, and the other led by his second-in-command, Admiral Collingwood, aboard the Royal Sovereign. With a little wind to speed their progress, the British ships slowly moved towards the Allied line, all while under fire from the French and Spanish ships. Finally, after almost an hour, victory passed between two French ships and fired a devastating broadside. Other ships followed, and a general melee ensued. Victory a double, found herself a double broadside? Can you even do that? A devastating broadside. Other ships followed, and a general melee ensued. Victory found herself engaging the French ship Redoubtable. The French crew had largely abandoned their cannons and were massing on deck to try and board the Admiral's flagship until they were cut apart by the cannon fire of a passing British ship. All the while, a murderous fire poured down from the Redoubtable's mast and rigging from sailors stationed up there with muskets. Nelson had forbidden his captains from doing this, worried about the sails catching on fire. Thus, unhampered, the French sharpshooters could pick their targets at will, and Nelson, standing on the quarter deck in his distinctive uniform, made for a perfect target. At around 1 p.m., an hour into the battle, Nelson was shot, the bullet entering through his shoulder blade and severing his spinal cord. The admiral collapsed to the deck, recognizing immediately that the wound was fatal. He was carried below deck and made comfortable, as there was nothing that the doctor could do for him. Nelson lived long enough to hear that yet another spectacular victory was his. The French and Spanish had lost 22 ships, the British had lost none. Thank God I have done my duty, Nelson said. The Admiral died at 4.30 at the age of 47. There was no celebration of the victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. Instead, the death of Admiral Nelson touched off a period of profound national mourning in Great Britain that wouldn't be seen again until the death of Princess Diana nearly 200 years later. Nelson's body was returned to England and given a state funeral at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Thousands of people lined the funeral route and packed the pews of the cathedral. I feel like it solidifies his legacy, though. That he was a hands-on guy who, who got arm amputated eye sh lost eye injuries all these and then and then fatally shot it just solidifying uh, and then winning before he died realizing he won the battle is just the the perfect story or to say goodbye to their hero people lined the funeral route and packed the pews of the cathedral to say goodbye to their hero one person not in attendance however was emma hamilton 
Nelson had neglected to amend his will to include Emma and Horatia, and although he begged the country to take care of them before he died, Nelson's brother, who inherited most of his estate, was completely uninterested in helping her. The British public may have been willing to overlook Nelson's affair because of his status as a national hero, but after his death, Emma was branded an adulterer and was shunned by her former friends. She died in 1815 at the age of 49, deeply in debt and suffering from a number of health problems. Admiral Nelson clearly, clearly looked fondly upon her. Why wouldn't they see that as enough to kind of treat her respectfully? Her daughter with Nelson, Horatia, lived a quiet life as a reverend's wife and raised 10 children, living until 1881. Nelson had so many places and things, of living descendants? things named after him that it would be impossible until 1881. Nelson had so many places and things named after him that it would be impossible to list them all. The most famous of these is Trafalgar Square in London, one of the most popular tourist attractions in the city. Located prominently in the square is a 145-foot, 44-meter granite column topped with a statue of the man who will likely forever be known as Britain's most beloved sailor. So I really and so the world's greatest sailor. If you found that video interesting, if you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos several times per week. And as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for making your amazing channels, your amazing, beautiful man with a great beard that I wish I could grow. Amazing figure. Awesome. I'll, I'll do more of these uh, biographics videos you guys recommended. I'll, I'll put, you know, four or five, three, four or five in a YouTube poll and see what wins and react to that. See you guys next time.